Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Now, uh, sorry. Now, Matthias Payer, uh, uh, who does now his uh, PhD in software security, uh, which. Um, um, sorry, uh, I must uh, start over. I'm a bit nervous today. So. I'm uh, proud to present uh, you Matthias Payer, who currently works on his uh, PhD in software security and uh, in a sub uh, theme uh, of his is uh, software defense. And uh, within uh, this uh, sub theme, he works on a topic uh, called string oriented programming, who, uh, where he does analyze how format string attacks uh, can be used uh, to attack programs. So give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much for the warm introduction. It kind of brought back memories to last year where I stumbled over the first couple of sentences. So let's just hope that this doesn't happen this time. Thanks. So to get to the topic, what is it all about? The motivation behind the work that I did here was that it, uh, there are a lot of additional protection mechanisms out there and they are used more and more in the wild. And uh, the standard security configuration is changing for uh, stock operating systems. So, uh, and in addition to that, additional hardware mechanisms are being developed that stop all our traditional exploits. And we need to find new ways to exploit these running systems to get access to the, to the code and to inject our own data. So we have hardware mechanisms like data execution prevention that is out there, that's standard, uh, that's usually available, uh, enabled right now and it's out there and used, and this makes many of the traditional exploits impossible, and, or a lot harder at least. And we also see, you don't have, actually have to read this, this table, but this is the comparison of the Ubuntu security features from the old versions, for, uh, for all the old versions. And basically you see that they started off with only a few little bits and pieces enabled, and the current version has like a ton of additional security features out there that protect from many of our standard and well-proven exploits. So what, what can we do about that? What part of it has been overlooked? Well, format strings had a big hype in around 2000 and something, but nowadays they are a bit overlooked. On the other hand, there's a drawback that they are very hard to construct. Uh, especially with a couple of these new protec protection mechanisms that are out there. So we need to define a way how we can deterministically exploit these format string bugs and get access to the machine in the end. And that's what this talk is all about. Um, if we look at the attack model that we, we assume, we see that an attacker with some restricted privileges on a machine uh, wants to escalate his privileges up to a higher level. So for example, we have a local user that wants to escalate his or her privileges to a, a system user account, or we have a remote user without any user capabilities that wants to force user capabilities on top of that. So we also assume we live in an open source world. This has many advantages, but one of the other of the downsides is that the attacker knows the source code, and if we are using a stock, stock image, like for example Ubuntu server, the attacker also knows the exact binary and can replay the exact same scenario that is used on the server at home in his little playground. So we have to assume that the attacker knows all these, these little things. On the other hand, we define a successful attack uh, to be if an attacker is able to redirect the control flow at one point in time to an alternate location by inject the data or inject the code. And we also uh, require the attacker to execute either inject the code that is now part of the runtime image or alternate data that is used for uh, existing code. So the outline of the talk looks a bit uh, uh, like, like this. First, I'm going to talk to you about the existing attack vectors that are out there, the protection mechanisms that are used to combat these techniques. Uh, 
Then I'm going to introduce string-oriented programming, show you a little demo or two, if time permits, and in the end conclude. And if the demo works, as we've seen up with the uh, in Saal 1 with the uh, telecom guys. So the first of the attack vectors that we all got very used to and we all loved was code injection, which is one of the very nice and simple exploits that inject additional code into the runtime image of an application through some, not through some attack vector. Maybe we can use a buffer overflow to inject code into the runtime image, but the uh, code is injected as data. So the processor will just execute that given data as new code, and in the end, uh, the attacker will have control over the application. So if we have this little example program, we have a nice little buffer on the, on the stack, and we execute our little string copy function. The buffer, of course, is limited, and in the end, uh, we will be able to override some stack data with that. Uh, for this example, we assume no protection mechanisms as have been uh, around in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, the stack looks a little bit like this. Um, we have our stack frame from the bottom. Uh, then we have the first argument to our little function, a safe return address, a base pointer, and our little temporary uh, array on the stack. So we start to copy our user input down from that, from that pointer, and we will end up with something that looks like this. We have some nice little knob slide and exploit code that we injected through that data buffer, and we override the return address to point back to the beginning of the buffer, and in the end we can get control over, uh, over the application like that, because we redirect the control flow, we injected new code, and in the end, we execute arbitrary code that is controlled by the attacker. Well, but things have changed since then. Modern hardware and operating systems separate data and code. So on a, a page level granularity, the operating system can enforce that it's either data or code that is on that, uh, on that memory page. And if it's data, and the attacker writes his nice code into that data page, and wants to execute it by overwriting the return instruction pointer, the processor will raise an exception and stop the program because it is not allowed to execute. Uh, due to this additional hardware, code injection is no longer feasible because uh, the protection mechanisms ensure that a page is either writable or executable, but never both. On the other hand, there are some limitations if we have a JIT program, like a Java virtual machine or things like that, they have a couple of pages around in memory where they place dynamically generated code. So we might still be able to get lucky with these old school exploits once in a while if the circumstances are right. So we already heard a little bit about the different uh, protection mechanisms, but let's just look at the three most dominant protection mechanisms that are out there that make our lives a li uh, little bit harder. So, the first protection mechanism is data execution prevention, called DEP, or exec shield on Linux systems. This protection mechanism enforces the executable bit that the hardware provides on a page level uh, granularity. And uh, if a page is not executable, then code on that page will not be uh, executed by the processor. This limits all our code injection exploits if it is set up correctly. So if this uh, is enabled, data execution prevention, we can no longer use code injection techniques to get control of the application. The next protection mechanism is address-based layout randomization. Address-based layout randomization is a probabilistic protection mechanism that is also enabled by default on uh, current kernels. And uh, ASLR enforces that all memory addresses on the heap, on the stack, and for, for all libraries are dynamically shuffled around and randomized. This leads to the fact that if you think back to the code injection uh, example or the code injection exploit, that uh, we can no longer redirect the return instruction pointer to the beginning of the buffer because we have no idea 
where this buffer is located in memory. But the current implementation in Linux uses a static application uh, where some part of the application still is located at a fixed address due to some optimization issues. And that's what we are going to use for that. And the last, uh, but nevertheless still important, protection mechanism that I'm going to talk about is ProPolis, which is used in uh, more current versions of GCC and so on. ProPolis adds additional canaries. A canary uh, is uh, a little bird that miners used in the old times to take down into the mine. And if the bird died, the miners knew that, well, the air is getting thin and we better should get out of here. The same uh, idea applies to canaries on the stack. The compiler places secret hidden values in specific locations on the stack and checks these in specific intervals if they are still the same. If there's been a buffer overflow, the canary values will change. The program will detect that and terminate itself because of the uh, buffer overflow that happened. So, well, if we combine these mechanisms, they make our life a lot harder. So let's look at what other attack mechanisms are out there that can help us in one way or another. We already know that code injection is no longer possible. So we have to move to a new attack form. And the new attack form no longer injects code or new code into the process image, but re-executes the already existing code with new data. So we, we search for specific code sequences, stitch them together, and just use a data-based approach to execute arbitrary uh, commands. The idea is that we go one level higher we no longer inject code directly, but we take a different approach. We see the program as a big interpreter that runs specific commands on top of it. So we just exploit the existing code sequences, reorder them, and due to the database approach that we have, we can execute arbitrary instructions in the end and also inject code then. Return-oriented programming is one of these data-based uh, attack forms that prepares uh, a set of stack frames on top of each other with specific uh, return instructions or return directions uh, to code sequences in the program that are available. So if we have the same sample program from before, we once again have the stack frame, we use our buffer overflow, but we assume that data execution prevention is, ena uh, is enabled, so we cannot inject uh, code into the st uh, onto the stack and execute it there, so we have to take a different approach. We once again copy the input, and we now don't care about what is in the temporary array at all, but we prepare a set of return addresses to point to a gadget catalog that we pre-identified based on uh, on existing, uh, on existing code. Does it get away? Mm. Yes. Um, so we search the application for nice instruction sequences that help us that always end with a return instruction. So we then uh, implement some kind of a stack machine on a stack with additional stack frames. You can see of the return address to as an indirect control flow transfer to a new catalog, and the data is then used uh, by these, uh, these instructions in the catalog. And if this gadget ends or completes, we execute the next gadget. So this sounds like a very nice idea, but what are the drawbacks? Um, if, we, if we use such an exploit, we, can, we still have the problem with address-based layout randomization because we don't know where to place the data and what we can do with that. And we also have a problem with propolis, with the stack canaries, because we just overwrite them and we are not able to, uh, to execute the first indirect control flow transfer that gives us the control over the application. So we have to escalate a little bit further. We have to uh, refine our idea a bit more. And that's where jump-oriented programming comes in. Jump-oriented programming abstracts the idea from return-oriented programming to use data as an uh, additional pro uh, attack form 
and moves from return instructions to any indirect control flow instructions. So any data region in the application that we control can be used as a scratch space to set up such an uh, interpreter. Let's look at it. We have a scratch space at some static address that we control with a set of uh, gadget addresses and data that we consume in this, uh, in this interpreter. So these gadget addresses point to the, uh, to the gadgets in our catalog. They are executed one after another. And the indirect jump transfer, control transfer at the end, always redirects the control flow to the big dispatcher. And the dispatcher moves from one uh, entry in the scratch space to the next entry and executes all our gadgets one after another. Using these two abstract approaches, we can basically construct any code that is executed. So we can chain a set of library commands, for example, uh, we can mmap a memory page, we can execute a string copy using the same approach that copies our uh, exploit data into the newly allocated memory page and we can then add a control flow transfer to that memory page and in the end execute our inject the code again. But we first use this data oriented approach to set up the scene for the following attack. So, well, what's the problem of jump oriented programming? Once again, we have ASLR in there. If we don't control the heap, we don't know the addresses on the heap, we cannot get around these randomization problems that we examine. We also have the problem of propolis, once again, if we have some buffers on the stack and we, uh, we get into trouble with the canaries. So we have to get around that as well. How can we do that? Well, maybe format strings will come to the rescue. Uh, format string bug uh, basically exploits the fact that a format string uh, well, let me, uh, let me tell you first what the format string is. A, f a format string is a special string that is allowed to contain specific tokens that are interpreted in a special way, in a very gener uh, general form. So you all, I, uh, I assume that you all know the printf command. Printf co the printf command has a special string as a first argument, and this string specifies how many arguments on the stack will be consumed by the, the string that is printed. If a user can control this first string, he can basically place uh, arbitrary special tokens in that string that read from the stack and also write to the stack if you use the, um, uh, the percent %n token. So the percent %n token is a very special feature that comes from very old Unix version, versions that reverse the input. Uh, and basically results in a random, uh, random memory write. So we redirect, we now redirect the input and we no longer consume values from the stack, but we write to, uh, to a specific location somewhere in memory and we can control that location. So if the string is on the stack, we can also use the same string to uh, store pointers and basically randomly write any data somewhere to memory if we construct a string uh, carefully. So we want to write coffee babe to OX4141441 uh, and construct a format string like that with two half word writes. The printf command uh, consumes the, the first format string. The first eight bytes of this format string are the two half word addresses. The first time the AAAA address and the second time the AAAC address. These two half word pointers uh, are then used in the, in the exploit itself. Then we use the, we just print a specific number of bytes to the, uh, to the terminal. In this case, we write uh, OX coffee minus the eight bytes that we already wrote to the, to the terminal. And we then use the sixth parameter. We assume that the string buffer that we control is on uh, is six words up on the stack. Then we use the first 
uh, first pointer in there to write the number of already printed bytes to the given pointer. Because percent %n can be used to write the number of written bytes to the terminal at that point in time to the, uh, to the given pointer. So we just write the OX coffee part, the first two bytes to the given address. In the old days, these things were used to, uh, for pretty printers, where you had a specific column width, and maybe you printed a string from a database or something like that, and you didn't know how long that string was, and you didn't want to call that expensive string length fun function. So you just stored a pointer, you just added a pointer somewhere that the percent %n then updated with the amount of already printed characters. And this way, it was very convenient to find these things or to use these things, but they're also a huge security problem that can be used up until today. So these random writes that we have can then be used to redirect the control flow or to prepare and inject uh, malicious data. Uh, basically, if you want to know more about the basic format string uh, attacks, this is only a short overview that I can give here. But if you want to know more about basic format string exploits, you should know the, you should uh, watch the Black Hat talk from this year where they talked about uh, new format string attacks that use the, the similar approaches with these, uh, with these parameters. Uh, and they go into great detail about how to, to construct these strings. But still, it's kind of very cumbersome to come up with these, uh, these strings. And to start with, it's very hard to get around ASLR, data execution prevention, and uh, properly things if you overwrite the specific parts in memory. So let me now come to a generic form to exploit this format string exploit that relies on many of the uh, attack vectors that I presented to you. String-oriented programming is the approach to execute arbitrary data, uh, arbitrary code through given data. What we need to construct such an exploit is a format string bug in an application and an attacker-controlled buffer somewhere on the stack. It doesn't matter where on the stack it is, we only need to know the offset from the printf function to that buffer on the stack. What we don't need to execute such an exploit is a buffer overflow, executable memory regions, or any other fancy things. Um, when we use string-oriented programming, we build on the attacks of return-oriented programming and jump-oriented programming. And uh, we also use these, some of these available gadgets in the application uh, to, to then execute nice code sequences. Uh, with string-oriented programming, we can also patch and resolve addresses. For example, if you want to call a library function that is not imported in the current, uh, in the current application, we can just resolve this, uh, this location uh, using some nice little gadgets that's usually available in the application. Uh, I told you before about the ASLR, uh, address-based layout randomization implementation in Linux, and they use a weak form of ASLR out of optimization issues. To randomly place the application somewhere in memory, you actually need to generate position-independent code when you compile the program. But the application is usually not so dynamic, so you have to place it always at the same location. And that's how um, we can come to our gadgets. We use the fixed application, search for our gadgets, and then also use static region, uh, regions in the application to construct our data flow in there. So for example, uh, if the application calls any library functions, we have things like a, a global offset table or a procedure link linkage table that is used by the linker uh, when the application is loaded to resolve connections to other shared libraries. And we can use these available offsets to, uh, to our, or for our needs. So if we want to resolve a hidden function, we just search for, uh, 
for a GOT slot that contains the pointer to that given function. The, uh, sorry, uh, if you want to resolve the, the pointer to a, uh, to a hidden function, the, the location of a hidden function somewhere in memory, if you want to break ASLR, we take the uh, uh, function that is used from the same library in the application, we read the pointer using a random read, and then we just add the offset between the original uh, imported function and the function that we want to execute to that GOT slot and therefore can resolve the given entry. So uh, we assumed that the attacker has access to the binary. So the attacker can just disassemble the library and check the offsets between the locations. If we have one pointer into the library, we can resolve any other function in that same library and just add and adjust the offset in the end. So we can call any hidden function, for example, a nice system function, without any larger support. So um, I now want to go through the steps of breaking all the different uh, protection mechanisms one after the other, and therefore we have this little running example. We have a buffer on the stack, the uh, user or the programmer added a length check that checks for the given length on the stack. If the input buffer is longer, then we fail. Then we copy it to the local buffer and just print that buffer. Uh, the attacker controls the string and can inject arbitrary data in there. So how does it look like? What can we do with that? First of all, if we don't have any protection at all, then all addresses are known. We don't have any execution protection, no stack protection, and nothing at all. So what we do is, here we have the three stack frames, the main frame, the foo frame, and from the foo frame we call the, the printf function. If you look into that, we have the buffer on the stack, we have uh, some unused bytes that are left out of, uh, for alignment reasons, we have our uh, EBP and EIP in the end. So what we do is we just uh, inject a string with a random write and some exploit code because we have no execution prevention so we can execute the data as code on the stack. The random write at the beginning of the, uh, of the format string will overwrite the saved EIP in the end uh, in the printf data to redirect it to the uh, to the format string, and it will then execute our nice exploit in the uh, in the in the buffer that we placed. But unfortunately, things are not that easy. So we add data execution prevention. So data execution prevention prevents code injection. So we have to rely on return-oriented programming and jump-oriented programming instead and go back to that. So fortunately for us, any program, as small as it is, even if, if it's just a one-liner, does not only consist of the one line of code that you add, but if, if you use the GNU C compiler, it will add a couple of, uh, of functions that actually set up the application, call the loader, and do many different things, and also initialize the libc and things like that. And as part of that setup code, that's always available in, the, in any compiled application, we have a nice frame lift gadget that we, we look at in a bit more detail. This frame lift gadget can be used to add OX1C bytes to the stack and gives us control over the EBX, ESE, EDI, and EBP registers. So using this little gadget that we have available at a static location in every single application, we can control four registers and we can adjust the ESP. With that little gadget, we can do some nice things, like once again we have our, uh, our, frame, our three frames and we look again at the foo frame in the middle and we place our random write and our stack invocation frames. In, these, um, in our buffer. So we then overwrite the return instruction pointer using the random write to the frame lift gadget. The frame lift gadget pops the 44 bytes from the stack 
ends up in our buffer that we control, and we now can execute uh, the stack invocation frames that are available in the buffer. Well, this is pretty nice, but there are other protection mechanisms out there. So, what happens if you use Propolis? Propolis uses and enforces these stack canaries. So, we once again have our three stack invocation frames. We look at them in a little bit more detail. The uh, GCC implementation of Propolis uses the stack canary at the end of the buffer to check for a buffer overrun and copies the arguments on, uh, at specific locations in the stack to ensure that the uh, following, following functions can always use the correct value of the, the parameter. But well, if we reuse the same mechanism, we can actually keep the canaries intact, intact and just reuse the same random write to redirect control to the frame lift gadget and we will end up in the stack again, uh, in our uh, stack buffer again, where, uh, where we can then use arbitrary stack invocation frames. The fun thing is, once you get around uh, the pro police protection, you no longer have to worry about these protections because you control the control flow and all the following control flow transfers. So as soon as you are able to redirect the control flow to your locations, you can execute arbitrary stuff and arbitrary stack frames and the, the game is lost for the uh, defense guy. So this is pretty nice and sweet, but what changes if we add ASLR, address space layout randomization to the picture? So if you combine address space layout randomization, data execution prevention and propolis. Uh, pro so if we combine all these defenses, we have to rely on the already existing code and on the static locations that we know about. Uh, we also have a set of imported functions in the application in the procedure linkage table and uh, uh, some symbols in the global offset table that we can reuse for our purposes. So in the end we can just use random byte writes to adjust these global offset table entries and redirect the control flow in a specific, specific way and then rely on the different functions that we set up that will be called in, uh, at other places in the, in the application. And we can then combine stack invocation frames that we place somewhere plus the indirect call and jump gadgets. So to make it a bit easier, uh, we just look at this little program here where we once again have a, a buffer of around one kilobyte on the stack, which is protected by Propolis so we cannot misuse the, the string copy function because otherwise the, the program will fault. We will then have a printf and some other function in the end. We don't really care about it as long as it is imported through some external library. It could be any function basically uh, for this example. So if we zoom into the application at the point where the printf is executed, we see a picture that looks a little bit like this. We have the static part of the application on the left hand side where we have a couple of uh, pages that are mapped readable and executable. That's the init section, the PLT section, the text section and the finish section that is available in the, uh, in the application itself. In the PLT section we have the two uh, link calls system at PLT and put as at PLT. And in the text section, at one point in time, we, we, uh, we have our little and nice lift ESP gadget. Um, at the point in time when we uh, execute our format string bug, the printf function, the stack check file function from Propolis, and the putS function all point somewhere into the libc code that is somewhere in memory at some randomized location. The libc, all other libraries, the heap, and the stack are all at random locations, and we want to get around that. So let's just zoom into the stack frame. Uh, it looks pretty similar than before, but um, now it's all at a random location, plus the canaries, plus the data execution prevention. So what do we do? We no longer need just 
one memory write, but we need, for this simple example, we need three random memory writes, plus a set of stack invocation frames. So our three random writes uh, help us to get control over the application. First of all, uh, we want to get around ASLR and Propolis. So we place some data in the read writable section that contains the global offset table, the procedural linkage table, and so on. And we just overwrite these two functions. Nobody told us that we actually have to rely or that these little things are pointers. We can also reuse them as just some scratch space where, uh, space where we can add any data. So we place the nice string slash bin sh into, uh, into some read writable uh, section that we can control. We now have, so uh, in, in system languages, you don't have a type checker. That's why we can just reuse any uh, memory regions for our own purposes. So we now have our nice string in there. You also see that we have a null byte in there. We can easily write null bytes with uh, these uh, format string bugs because you can just control it. The null byte doesn't have to be part of the format string. We can just write zero bytes and then write the zero somewhere to a given, given location. So the second, uh, these are the first two writes. Bin, uh, bin shell are uh, eight bytes long. The third byte redirects one of the imported functions. We no longer can just easily redirect the stack, the return instruction pointer on the stack, but we have to uh, override a specific function that is called in the control flow of the application after our exploit takes place. Uh, in our example that we just looked at, the put as function is executed right after the return from the printf. So we just override the, the put as, uh, the put as slot in the global offset table to point to the lift ESP gadget. So when we now execute uh, the put as, or when the application executes the put as, uh, put as function, it gets redirected to the lift ESP gadget, which in turn will pop a specific amount of bytes from the stack, which will end up in our buffer that we control, and in the end we can just execute our, uh, our placed, our special uh, stack invocation frames and use return-oriented programming for that. If we would like to use jump-oriented programming, we could, we could use a similar approach where we redirect it through the return address to some uh, jump-oriented programming uh, space. So, to make you believe that this actually works, I have this little program here, the format string bug with all these things. We can add uh, a parameter in the end. This time it's ASDF. It prints out some debug values. Main is located here, foo is here, argv is here, and we have other values in there. And here we print ASDF, and the put as function prints out that a nice redirect is possible. And we return safely. Let's execute it again. You see here that, oh, these things are actually randomized. I'm not joking. You see all these things, some of these things change. But other things like foo, all, all uh, functions that are part of the actual application remain the same because they are static. So let's just execute our format string. We have the same program. We use our little format string construct Python script. We write, uh, we place stack invocation frames on the stack in the buffer, and we prepend our generated format string with some uh, garbage data or with some additional data. Here we have a coffee babe. It's always good to have one of these coffee babes around. Then we add our stack invocation frame, where we have just one frame, where we use the put as, the, the system function that we imported, and we give 
the pointer to the global offset table or the part of the global offset table where we placed our string in. We then tell our format string constructor that, well, we have to, our, the, the buffer that we control is 12 words uh, above the printf function so that we can adjust the parameter accordingly. And we write three values. To this value, which is the same as this value here, we write the first part of uh, slash bin shell. And to the other four bytes here, uh, at the later point, we write the second part of bin bash. And we also overwrite the put as function, which happens to be a dislocation in the global offset table with the nice value of our frame lift gadget. So if we execute this, it runs, it runs, it runs, and we end up in a shell. And if you are an external user, we now have control over the application. And we go back and we fault. So these things can nicely be used as a chain of escalation to break all the different exploit mechanisms. We got around ASLR, we got around data execution prevention, and we got around pro police all in one go with one simple simple little, uh, little format string. You can also look at the format string. It's 127 bytes long. Let's just look at it without that. So it's just 127 bytes long. There are the pointers that we use in the beginning. Then we generate the random writes, a couple of half words that we write, and in the end, we win. So let's switch back to the presentation. You all believe me that these things work. The script is fairly easy. Uh, it will be on the, on the web page. You can look at it, and you can generate your own format string. And it comes with some additional playing material as well that you can use to get around it. So what did we learn? First of all, string-oriented programming relies on a format string exploit and extends data-oriented programming, like return-oriented programming, jump-oriented programming. We now see the application as an interpreter for our data that we add. And this interpreter can be used to execute arbitrary code. We can easily circumvent data execution prevention using one of these data-oriented uh, one of these data-oriented techniques, and we can get around propolis by using the format string exploits to exactly just override the values that we want to change, and we can reconstruct any pointer and circumvent ASLR using these global offset table and procedural linkage table tricks that I I've shown you a bit. So, the format string bug that or format string bugs that we see here can result in a complete compromise of the application and full control of for the attacker. So to protect against string oriented programming, we would need to work or we would need to go one level higher and maybe use virtualization techniques or things like that. And we also have to look at the complete tool chain where these format string bugs actually come in. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Yes? Um, I have actually two questions. First of all, well, it uh, seems to heavily rely on format string bugs. And, um, well, if the format strings are implemented correctly, then this whole thing doesn't work. Well, if your program doesn't have a buffer overflow, you have no exploit as well, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, and the second question is, you mentioned the gadgets that the GCC leaves mm -hmm. uh, in the program. But wouldn't it be basically possible to kind of externalize these gadgets because they are needed at initialization of the program only. And um, maybe if one adds some code to Linux program execution, then uh, these gadgets wouldn't be visible to the program itself. Well, in theory, yes. 
but it's hard to do. Part of the gadgets also come from the area where you can have constructors and deconstructors, and they're just in there by default. If your program uses them, you actually have to add them too to the application. You could just strip them if your program doesn't use it. But GCC just uses a set, a small set of these uh, start files, mm. uh, as they are called, and adds them by default, even if your program doesn't use it. You could change the Linux kernel in one way or another, but then you would basically just move the loader into the kernel. And the loader is a huge mess of code that you don't really want to look at. Uh, okay. Did that answer your question? Okay, thanks. Okay, the I internet? have one small inquiry from IRC. Um, Angstrom asks uh, what Black Hat talk you were referring to earlier regarding format string exploits. Uh, the At which, which Black Hat probably would be enough? The 2011, this year's Black Hat. Okay, because uh, it's apparently. Yeah. Extended format string exploits by Blitch, I think. Okay. I, would, I would have to look it up. Okay. I can put it uh, on the, on the okay. slides when I put them on the web page. Yeah, apparently he looked at 2011, didn't find anything. But okay, if you say it's there, it's probably there. And uh, one uh, that's begging for holy war, uh, Joey A1 from IRC asks, um, according to Microsoft, the person sign N type has been disabled since 2005, and he wants to know why it's still available on Linux. Because a lot of old software is still using it. <laughs> There are guards out there that are impl implemented in newer versions, but basically libc is a huge mess in one way, where you can just disable these guards at runtime with some... In your format string exploits, you can disable the guards that sh should check for the format string exploit. So that's just an additional <laughs> nice thing that's out there. <laughs> But I didn't add that to the slides because it would get too complicated. But the percent %n is still out there, and you can still use it. If you have a format string that you can control, so if you have a printf where the attacker can control the format string, even if these protections are enabled, you can get around them pretty easily. Okay. Are there any other questions? So, I don't see any other questions here in the room. So, thank you, Matthias. It was a very interesting talk. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>